Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. This episode of Changing Higher Ed is sponsored by Perdia Education, a national leader in online student recruitment and enrollment services, providing institutions enrolled students risk-free on a performance-based model with no long-term contract. If your online programs could benefit from incremental online student enrollments, visit perdiaeducation.com. That's P-E-R-D-I-A education.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Vicki Schrey, Executive Vice President and Chief External Affairs Officer at Zovio. Vicki has a long history in higher ed, and especially in public policy development, implementation, and government relations. Before Zovio, she spent 12 years in a variety of leadership positions at the U.S. Department of Education, including Deputy Director for the Secretary of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education and Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Post-Secondary Education. At Zovio, Vicki is responsible for developing and implementing strategies to position the company as a trusted leader and manage external relationships and stakeholder communications. And she joins us today to talk about innovation and how higher ed needs to and is changing. Vicki, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Drum. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. We had such a great conversation yesterday and last week. I'm excited about this uh, episode. I am too. Thank you again. So let's just jump right in as we typically do. Higher ed is going through massive changes at this point. They're, They're changes that have been needed for a long period of time. COVID obviously accelerated a lot of things. And in the words of my good friend, Gordon Gee, COVID has accelerated needed changes in higher ed by a decade or more. It's all about innovation. It's all about creating better learning outcomes for students. So what are some of the factors that you see that are driving this need for innovation? You know, before the pandemic hit, all sectors of higher education were being disrupted by a number of forces, as you pointed out, demographic shifts, student course taking patterns, students were beginning to take courses from multiple multiple institutions simultaneously, a lot of financial instability for institutions. All of these things were accelerated by COVID. In addition, you know, Over the last 15 to 20 years, I've heard university presidents across the country talk about the need for change to really address the shrinking pipeline of high school students. And while the projection was that 2025, 26 would be the big cliff, again, the pandemic accelerated the need to rethink how institutions serve the populations, particularly the growing population of what I like to call contemporary students, which are working adults or adults that have at least one risk factor identified by the Department of Education. I think you add to that, and we haven't touched on it yet, just the dramatic change in jobs and work. Some jobs all but disappeared during the pandemic. Others grew significantly. There's huge shift during the pandemic to digitization uh, to reduce physical interaction, for example, virtual health care and assessment by doctors. So all of these things have really dramatically changed the need for reform. Institutions are now trying to think of how to develop curriculum and prepare for jobs that don't yet exist. Well, you know, those are really important points, uh, especially what targeted for me is the jobs going away and new jobs. You know, some of them, of course, like you said, we haven't even thought about, but I think this is really important for higher ed. And we'll come back to this point in a while when we talk about, you know, what higher, higher ed should be doing. But How do you deal with jobs that you don't know are going to exist? 
You know, for many years, we've talked a lot about American business needs to compete on innovation. And I would say that now applies to higher ed. They need to really take a hard look at what are the new skill requirements in this brave new world that we're facing. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, what are the skill sets required to operate in these environments? And I think the way institutions need to address it, and you'll you'll hear me mention this many times throughout our conversation, is they have to collaborate. They have to work closely with employers to identify what are those new skills and be agile enough to modify curriculum, both the length of the curriculum, the approach to the curriculum, to prepare individuals to meet these ever-changing demands. And this is a new way of universities thinking because, you know, I don't like to use the term silo, but I think it applies here. When you've got just faculty developing curriculum, are they up on the latest things that come out of industry? I would say, you know, there's always best practice examples and pockets of excellence around the country. But I would say overall, universities are not well equipped to uh, collaborate in this new environment. I think this, uh, we're at a very unique and challenging moment in our history. And it not only creates new opportunities for collaboration, and demands for collaboration, but it's also a challenge to institutions, faculty, leadership, who have not had to operate in that environment. Mm -hmm. I had a guest on the show just recently, Dr. Tony Mm Wuta, who's the provost at Howard, and I know you know Tony. Mm -hmm. They have had multiple initiatives like this. In fact, they're just kicking off a new one with Amazon Web Services, they'll be developing a master's in data analysis, data management, a whole new center that's schooling up. And they've been doing something with Google along those same lines for three years now. In fact, I just read this morning that they are one of 10, 15 HBCUs to receive a $5 million grant from Google for developing technology-related programs. Mm -hmm. So you're right. There are these pockets around the country that are doing really good stuff. This is something where Zovio has really played a big part. We work with over 200 universities to provide them and support them in offering, for example, boot camps, cybersecurity, right? High demand areas that offer opportunities for high wage, high earnings for individuals. And I think those types of partnerships, like the ones that you mentioned, the types that we do, are a really good example of how universities can leverage expertise, external expertise, to really help meet this growing demand. Well, some institutions are actually developing their own curriculum development shops, you know, Mm -hmm. instead of you know, outsourcing to an OPM such as yourself, they're doing it themselves, which in many respects is a great idea because you've got to have folks who understand collaboration, understand the technology, and understand what employers need. That's one of the things that you guys at Zovio, you excel at. You know, uh, I I totally agree. I I think the challenge is, and having done that type of work in my previous life in community colleges, where I led the customized training, as we called it back in the day, working directly with partners, industry partners to develop curriculum. If an institution has the capacity to do it in-house, it's fantastic. I think the issue is the demand is so great. And some institutions don't have that in-house expertise that there's real value in partnering with a private sector company, uh, not only to launch the content and the curriculum and the programs, but also to scale up pretty quickly. Again, the demand is so great. Uh, I don't know that we have the luxury of building individual programs that are very locally focused to really meet the demand. I think we have to look at expanding beyond those types of efforts. Again, 
collaborating and partnering to really help Americans get back to work in this country post pandemic. I think you're right. And, and Mike was talking about this very thing yesterday. The, some of the biggest challenges that folks are seeing right now in, in the biggest decision they have to make is do they buy it or do they build it? Or is it a hybrid model? And I think that's, yes. you know, again, I look at the work that we do. We offer a myriad of options. You can unbundle the various services and pick and choose to complement whatever the institution's capabilities are. You can acquire enterprise-wide solutions. I think that's the beauty is looking at partners that can support the academic leadership, support the faculty in meeting the needs of both their current students and prospective students. Mm -hmm. And so what's being done right now on the governmental level? I mean, so many people have lost jobs. So what is the government doing to help these folks along besides giving them unemployment checks, which are going to run out? Yeah, they're, you know, I don't know. Uh, and you and I have talked about it. I I've been around a very long time. Well, but you don't look it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> You're my favorite interviewer. Um, <laughs> You know, I have a lifetime certification as a member of the Senior Executive Service in the government. And I have worked multiple administrations and seen lots of initiatives. I have never seen so much money pumped into both the higher education, K-12, and workforce development system. I think the challenge is, and we can touch on, you know, some of the various funding streams that are out there. For example, the American Rescue Plan, ARP, those funds are aimed at supporting recovery and aid efforts in the economy and for the American worker. States received over $360 billion just for this one piece of legislation to support public-private partnerships, the very thing that we're talking about, $3 billion for economic development, $400 million to veterans. This is just one bill. You look at you know what's been going on with the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act of 2021. Just recently, on June 8th, uh, the U.S. Senate adopted uh, that bill. It's now going to the House of Representatives, but again, it's to help boost kind of the, the competitiveness of this country. And it, it feeds into our conversation about the jobs of the future when you're looking at artificial intelligence, semiconductor production, scientific research. There's a lot of pieces that, again, fit nicely into the conversation we're having. We also have the Investing in Tomorrow's Workforce bill that was introduced in both the House and the Senate to address the needs of workers in industries that are likely to be impacted by the rapidly evolving technologies. And those are just a few examples. Again, I think the challenges and having been a student of federal policy over the last 25 years, they are well-intended but I think the impact is not fully realized because we're not able to bring education providers, workforce, employers together to really think about how do we create, utilize these funds to create seamless pathways for individuals, whether they're job seekers or whether they're traditional students, but creating, you know, we've heard the terms career ladders, career lattice career webs. I mean, we are now in an economy where jobs are changing so rapidly. You know, I like to say lifelong learning used to be just kind of a tagline. It's real and it's critically important to individuals. So a lot going on here in Washington, D.C. and at the state level, but I think we really need to relook at how we've approached policy implementation use of these types of funds really to the benefit uh, of the American worker and learner. Well, it sounds like it is almost a, I'd say 50% to 60% rethinking of what is the purpose of higher education? I think you're right. You know, I, there's been some studies out recently, you know, particularly kind of the Gen Z population and what they're looking. And it used to be, I mean, I 
led the U.S. Department's effort around career and technical education for a number of years. I was a former career and technical educator myself. You know, it used to be taboo to ever say that college isn't for everyone. But I think where we are now in the conversation, maybe what it is is a traditional college education is not for everyone, right? You see a lot of students, I've seen my own children go to traditional universities, but they're also taking industry credentials along the side. My youngest just uh, completed her graduate degree in occupational therapy. But as part of that, she also got a credential in supporting adolescents. It was a shorter term certificate. So you see individuals really bundling the education and training they're receiving to make them more competitive and employable in this new economy. And I think that's a critical piece of all this. You know, my mind goes back to one of the Scandinavian countries, I think it was Sweden. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing this about a year ago and they were talking about people losing jobs. And there was one man who said, hey, I don't worry about losing a job because I know the government is gonna come in and train me for the next best thing. So I don't have to worry about it. We're starting to see this here in the US with funding going more to institutions Mm -hmm. than it is to the individual. And so that's part of what I was saying with this rethinking of the purpose of higher education I mean, the community college bill that, you know, if that ever gets through for the free, free community college, mm-hmm. that certainly will be one way of doing these things. But there's still the missing piece that you allude to about the partnering with industry, the partnering with employers to make sure that these institutions are teaching what the employers need, thinking of themselves as the talent supply chain. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing that's very interesting to me as I look at AI and machine learning and what I'm starting to see almost as a resurgence of the need for soft skills. And, you know, there's been some analysis done recently looking at those types of occupations that utilize that technology. They really are looking for individuals who have, you know, a lot of EQ that work well in teams that have critical thinking it, you know, so you still see a real value to a traditional liberal arts type of approach. I think what we're now seeing and you touched on this. We need to marry the best of liberal arts and learning and critical thinking with some of the new technology and technical skills. It's almost like a new version of technical education that embodies both of what traditional universities offer as well as bringing in kind of the real world skills and knowledge needed for success. I think you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, Ashley Finley was on the show a little while ago. I know you know Ashley. She's Mm -hmm. from AACNU, and they had just released their latest study about what skills employers need. The number one skill on that was the ability to work effectively in teams. Mm -hmm. Second, critical thinking skills. Third, ability to analyze, interpret data. Mm -hmm. You know, fourth, application of knowledge, skills, and real world settings. I mean, these are all part of a what they call a liberal education, getting people to think critically, to be able to communicate, be able to work with others. That's part of the reason why I have my own business. I don't want to have to work with others. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you're, you're spot on with that is, and what comes to mind for me is in the looking at new ways of teaching at looking at new curriculum. You've got to have a practical application in there, whether it's a couple of internships, whether it's, you know, whatever it looks like, but you've got to have practical experience for these folks graduating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's been a real push, you know, and again, the pandemic accelerated this, just like all of the other you know, issues that we've touched on, creating with business kind of real world business cases that students can complete and experience, right? They've been able to virtually create these kinds of opportunities for students, which, 
you know, we haven't really talked about the fact that, you know, the pandemic created havoc for individuals in our country and across the world, but it also brought to light kind of the disparity in the poor economies and the students that were disadvantaged by not having the access. I think there may be an upside to really laying bare some of the inequities in this country and using technology as a means to really provide all individuals with access to a high quality education and opportunity for continued training. Yeah. So at this point, should I tell all the Republicans who are listening to plug their ears? <laughs> you can tell whoever <laughs> to plug their ears. <laughs> I told you I'm like Switzerland drum. I'm neutral. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, I get it. <laughs> and I do my best to be. <laughs> so we, we've talked some real good high level things. Let's get down into the weeds a little bit. What is higher ed doing and what should they be doing to make all of this innovation work? I think, and I've said this for years and years to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, all public policy really needs to be driven by one thing, what is best for the student or the learner, and have that be, you know, learner-centric should be the focus. There's a lot, again, we've talked about it. Uh, there's examples around the country of this, but I don't think it's scaled to the the level it needs to be. Institutions really thinking through what are the skills needed for the jobs of the future, and then how do they build that in to provide the quality education needed for folks entering these emerging fields. There's a lot of talk and a lot of terrific examples of micro-credentials. How do you even take a traditional college program of study and chunk it up and build in micro-credentials along the way to make the individual more employable? There are, you know, again, the pandemic institutions overnight were forced to dive headfirst into online virtual learning. And there has been some terrific examples of quality online, but a lot of examples of nothing more than a Zoom class and a you know PowerPoint posted. I, I think when the university leaders that I'm talking to, they realize and they've taken steps, but a lot more needs to be done to really create high quality virtual learning, online, asynchronous opportunities for individuals. And I think it's critical now more than ever, again, going back to the point about the shrinking traditional age population, if institutions don't dramatically change how they do business, again, to meet the needs of the adult learner, they're not going to be around much longer. And so I think it's really, really important that they use the pandemic, you know, as a, a very serious warning and signal that they have to make change and they have to do it very quickly. And I think this is really critical, especially when I think about shared governance. Mm -hmm. Shared governance can be your best friend and your absolute worst enemy. Many institutions now are looking more at the change management process and how to be able to implement these changes. Because as we all know, if the faculty say, what is this? This is crazy. You can bring an entire university change efforts to its knees or worse, you know, put it in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's such a missed opportunity for the university as a whole, for the faculty especially, where, you know, if you think about your students not as this pipeline coming in, but versus once you get those students and help them uh, to successfully complete their degree, view them as kind of a lifetime client. Universities have the opportunity to look for and partner with employers or companies like ours and others to provide upskilling to their alumni throughout their lifetime. It's, it's a business model that I don't know a lot of universities have embraced yet. Again, particularly when you're looking at their traditional population shrinking so dramatically. We're seeing it already, again, primarily due to COVID, but the enrollment numbers are, are continuing to decline, creating huge financial challenges for these universities. And so I think it's a new 
kind of business model, it's additional revenue that they could bring in. I mean, I just think there's a huge upside for everybody to think very differently about how we do our work. I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to have these conversations. We need to be having them now. For example, how many institutions have gone out and surveyed their alumni? to find out what they need and how the university can support them going forward. You know, the only time I, you know, and you know, I won't mention who I, my alum school is undergraduate, but frankly, the only time I hear from them, I get a a monthly magazine, which is great because I can keep (laughs) up with all my classmates. But then the only time I hear from them really is it's time for that annual fundraising drive. Right. And that's a big turnoff. No, I totally agree. Again, I just think there is so much opportunity. And, you know, as I look at kind of the the major reform efforts, both in education and workforce development that I've personally been involved in or led over the years or that are uh, ongoing, you know, it takes a long time for these big systems to embrace change. And they usually don't embrace change until there's enough pain in the system that they're almost forced to do it. And I think we're at that point for higher education. They are in such extreme pain. They may be more willing to rethink kind of the future of higher education. Which is exactly what they need to do. You know, I take a look at John Cotter's eight steps for change management. First one is create an urgency around the change. Well, guess what, sports fans? We've got that right (laughs) now. Yes, we do. Sadly, we do. Yes, we do. So, you know, real quickly, what's the role of ed tech in all of this? You know, it, it it's a great question. I was in a meeting uh, earlier this week with other providers like ourselves having this very conversation. The, the first question is, how do you define ed tech? And, you know, in my mind, ed tech offers solutions, products, to help educators, education providers uh, serve the very students and their clients. And it includes a a range of things, as you know, data analytics, the, I mean, amazing, amazing things that are done now with data analytics to solve universities' problems around retention of students, helping students who have dropped out. There's all kinds of things that can be done with data analytics to really support universities, all the digitized content, all the various tools and solutions to make the student experience engaging and worthwhile. And I think, you know, we talked about, I would say all universities have been forced to go online in some form or fashion, not, you know, there there have been varying degrees of success in that. Ed tech can support universities to really build robust online programs so that they're ready for the next disaster, which could be, and we've seen it, wildfires, floods, hurricanes. I mean, there's a, a number of instances where institutions are forced to go online. One of the things I'm most passionate about right now is how ed tech can support and help address the significant learning loss that students have experienced at all levels due to the pandemic. We have a a company, which is an online tutoring company, that has just exploded during the pandemic, helping parents provide the tutoring students to their children throughout, helping college students. I mean, it's just the ability to tap into a qualified tutor in just a few minutes and get the help you need immediately has been a game changer for families, for learners across the board. So ed tech can, I think if institutions view ed tech as a partner to listen to their needs and support their needs, I think there's huge opportunity. I think there's a little fear maybe of losing academic control by some, but like anything, I think determining what ed tech has to offer, how it helps and it can be customized to meet faculty needs, university needs. I think there's just a tremendous opportunities for all going forward. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully agree. So unfortunately, we are getting close to the end of a time. It always happens when I have interesting guests like yourself. It's like, oh my gosh, where did this half hour go? (laughs) But three takeaways for higher ed presidents. You know, the first is to seek opportunities. We've talked about a lot for collaboration. Leverage your brains out. Seek opportunities to partner with local employers, regional chambers of commerce. Uh, Just look for ways, again, where we can bring education together with the workforce development arm to really come up with lasting approaches. I think particularly in, uh, you know, post-pandemic and dealing with the non-traditional or the contemporary students, one of the biggest takeaways that I'd like to offer is to rethink and evaluate the student experience. A lot of traditional universities are not fully equipped to meet the needs of the contemporary student. They need to identify and remove barriers. They need to think about you know, prior learning experience. They need to think about transfer of credits and how we make admissions and enrollment easier. So it's rethinking how we treat the students both of today and tomorrow. And the final thing, uh, just to reiterate, they need to be willing and open to new business models. Students as lifetime members and potential lifetime learners, and how do you build a robust system that includes micro-credentials and opportunities for upskilling and reskilling post-graduation. So those are the three that I would recommend to university presidents in this country. Thank you. I am so glad you covered that last one because it's such right now, in my opinion, is the time for folks to be going back and rethinking their business models, rethinking how they deliver education. And don't be afraid to do it. Bring faculty in to have that conversation. Bring business leaders, bring stakeholders from all different walks of life so that you can come up with a model that is going to work and a model that's flexible that can change when you get another disruption like COVID. Mm-hmm. So Vicki, what's next for you? What's next for Zovio? Oh, well, you know, I have had uh, the honor of being at the intersection of higher education and workforce my entire career. And everything we've talked about just makes me feel more strongly. We are on the cusp of finally kind of realizing the vision and all of the changes. And so for me personally, I, I hope that I can continue to be part of this really important dialogue. For Zovio, uh, we do and provide a lot of the things that we've talked about for universities, for companies across the country, really focusing on serving the contemporary learners. So it's an exciting time, and I just look forward to continuing this conversation with you and many others in this country, Drum. Absolutely. I look forward to it as well. I have a feeling that we're going to end up working together somehow. They just have that sense. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> so. Well, Vicki, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has just been wonderful. Some great messages for presidents and you know, the changing face of higher ed. That's what it's all about right now. Well, again, thank you for the invitation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening this week, and a special thank you to this week's special guest, Vicki Schrey, Executive Vice President at Zovio, and for her sharing with us how OPMs are transforming higher education. Our next guest is Dr. Philly Mantella, President of Grand Valley State College, who'll be joining us to talk about REP4, a national alliance of six colleges and universities formed to address equity and access issues in higher education. REP4, which stands for Rapid Education Prototyping, puts the power incentive of establishing new equitable systems for public education in the hands of those who have the most at stake, learners. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.